Hello, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you to the um, organizers for um, calling me to give this talk on new perspectives. Um, I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. And the learning objectives of the talk are listed uh, in your program. And here they are just very briefly. So I'd like to start with a recent update on mortality and incidence of cervical cancer. On the x-axis, you see the incidence. And on the y-axis, you see the mortality. And as, um, as in previous decades gone by, Africa is the worst for both mortality and incidence. Also, to some extent, Latin America. And no surprise, US, North America, and Europe are down here. You can see the colors. And one would guess that some of the um, countries where incidence is much higher than mortality are doing a much better job in terms of the therapy of the uh, disease. How are we doing in terms of time, uh, uh, in terms of elapsed time? Well, the incidence of mortality has gone to fourth place for cervical cancer. It used to be worldwide second place. Um, the crude mortality has increased somewhat from 2012 uh, to almost uh, to a little over 300,000 cases. And looking at certain countries, um, some are doing quite well, UK, USA, seems to be a bit of a plateau here, uh, whereas some countries is, uh, no surprise, not doing that well, Brazil, uh, Brazil, Latin America, Mexico. So uh, we know that HPV is a major factor in most cervical cancers and in a lot of anogenital cancers. Um, uh, not necessarily the, the total cause, but a, a major driver in any event. Um, there's still a lot of screening being done by cytology. So, again, you know, uh, why use HPV DNA tests? Well, I've been answering this question for 30 years, um, and yet people are still somewhat resistant to HPV testing in some places. HPV causes most of the cancers. That's pretty much a no-brainer. Uh, HPV testing is substantially more sensitive than cytology, um, 30 to 50 percent more. However, uh, okay, the specificity of HPV testing is not as high, and therefore we need uh, a triage. Um, the sensitivity of cytology is also highly variable between labs. Uh, whereas HPV testing is reproducible uh, because it's an automated test. Um, so some of the reasons why HPV testing really should be used, uh, and in m most countries in Europe, they're switching to primary HPV screening. U uh, UK is a recent example. It's already in in many other countries. Um, so HPV testing can be used in many ways. Um, it can be used for a screening test. Uh, as an adjunct to cytology. It can be used as a sole primary test. And indeed, what's growing in, uh, may I say, popularity is self-sampling uh, to deal with women in remote areas and those who don't really like a speculum exam. And, you know, in terms of adherence to routine screening programs, we are at a historic low in most countries, certainly in Europe and the U.S. as well, with only about 65% attendance for recommended screening intervals. And I think that's where self-sampling is going to come in and play an important role. In terms of the test options, Hybrid Capture 2 was the first test, um, and I developed that test. FDA approved in 1999. Um, subsequently, there are uh, a number of other tests that were approved. Uh, TMA Hologic, uh, approved in 2011. PCR, uh, Roche Cobos, Abbott, and hundreds of other kits approved uh, uh, post-2011. So there's a lot to choose from. Uh, and all of these tests work quite well, you know, some have more sensitivity, some have uh, better specificity, but there's a lot to choose from. Now, cervical cancer, as I alluded to on my first slide, remains a major problem in poor regions. And you can see the red areas here being the problem areas and the orange areas 
of course, because of the huge population of India, uh, there's well over 100,000 uh, cases per year there. Uh, it's a major hotbed and a problematic area. But the global challenge then of cervical cancer prevention is related to a number of points. And we do hope that the vaccine really plays a huge role in this, but um, at the moment, there's still inadequate protection. Most women worldwide have not been vaccinated even once. Um, the efficacy and duration of the vaccine is still not sufficiently validated. We don't know how high it's going to be for cancer. You see a lot of data touted about the efficacy for SYN3, but most SYN3 actually don't develop into cervical cancer. So one has to be just slightly cautious. We're still waiting on actual cancer incidence reductions. Um, in terms of screening, uh, most women worldwide haven't been screened, uh, and tens of millions have not been screened adequately. Uh, and the barriers to progress are obvious, especially outside of the rich countries. Uh, you know, lack of personnel, funds, motivation, political will, you name it. Uh, lots and lots of reasons and excuses for why these women are not being looked after. Now, let's just look at a few studies in these places. For example, in Peru, uh, a study showing that HPV testing was the um, most highly sensitive test. You can see here on the, uh, there's the chance curve, there's the HPV test, hybrid capture two, some of the other things, VIA, LBC, and these are showing you, you know, the sensitivity versus one minus the specificity, or if you will, the false positive rate this way and the true detection rate this way. Uh, a very classic study from Denny et al., uh, JNCI, which basically showed that um, if you see and treat HPV positives, no lesions, you just see and treat HPV positives, uh, this is the incidence over 36 months of the uh, CIN2, and it's the most protect protective versus the control, and this is a C and treat VIA. So treating HPV infections on the transformation zone is protective of future disease. However, it can't be recommended because it still would lead to a huge amount of, uh, you know, just uh, preemptive treatment. Uh, finally, one study in India by uh, Shankar et al., which shows you that the cumulative mortality was the lowest for women in the HPV arm. This was a randomized control trial with a number of arms, and this is number of years of follow-up, and this is the cumulative mortality. And here you're looking for the closest to the bottom, and you can see HPV testing is substantially more protective than the control, PAP, VIA, et cetera. So um, what about self-sampling? I did mention that, uh, and there's a very large sampling uh, study using vaginal self-collection uh, performed in Mexico, the so-called March randomized control trial. And the participants were predominantly from rural underserved communities. Um, and the community nurses went out to the women, gave them the self-sampler, they did it in their home, and the women who were allocated to cytology were invited by the nurses to come in to the local screening clinic. So that's the way it was. It was a two-arm randomized controlled trial. And this shows you a simplified diagram of the randomization and the outcomes. So roughly 9,200 uh, women um, accepted for the HPV test and 11,000 women accepted for the PAP test. Um, the first thing that comes out is the huge difference in colposcopies. Uh, these colposcopies were done based on who was positive. Very few positives on cytology and they identified, we identified, sorry, this is part of my study, uh, CIN2 plus 38 cases. Uh, however, from the HPV arm, 108 cases of CIN2 plus. 
And uh, if we look at the relative sensitivity here for CIN2+, plus, um, you can just look at the um, one picogram cutoff. This was hybrid capture too, and this is roughly where most PCR tests operate, perhaps at this level or even more sensitive. So the relative sensitivity, that is compared to cytology in the Eligible women aged 30 to 60 was four, so four times as much disease was discovered. And that was true for cancer as well as CIN3. Four times as much cancer was discovered. However, the positive predictive value was only 14.5%. So in a, uh, in, in a realistic way, for every 100 colposcopies that the local uh, colposcopists would do, only 14 cases roughly of CIN2 would be discovered. A massive overburdening of the uh, colpo resources. And we did show in another study that I'm not presenting here that the more you overburden the colpo clinics, the worse they do. So you really can't go down that route. Um, if we look at, uh, this was a um, meta-analysis performed in China, self-sampling HPV clinician, uh, and LBC cytology by Zhao et al. What we see is that, um, of course, the HPV clinician sampling was the most sensitive. Uh, LBC cytology in China performed very well, and self-sampling was just about the same performance. This is for CIN3+. Plus. Um, again, HPV testing was less specific than cytology, so something to be aware of. So uh, a little bit about the uh, PAD startup project. Um, and this is a study looking at a number of countries, uh, mostly in remote regions, um, using HPV testing, using something called the CARE HPV test, uh, and comparing it to pap smear VIA, visual inspection with acetic acid. And in this particular study run by Jose Geronimo, we can see that the sensitivity and the specificity of HPV testing in these settings was better than either VIA or pap smear, both of them. You can see self-sampling here, 69% um, uh, and specificity of 91% versus for cytology, 58% versus 87%. So it has to do really with where the study is being done, but I think that um, uh, that, works, uh, that works quite well in, in some cases. So um, issues with triage for cytology must be repeated due to relatively low sensitivity. Uh, HPV-16-18 genotyping uh, must be repeated. Uh, DNA methylation, I'm going to talk uh, about that. There's no FDA-approved test. So DNA methylation is, is the future in a sense. Epigenetics then... Uh, is a, uh, uh, the, the big picture for DNA methylation. Um, and epige epigenetic change is a regular and natural occurrence. Uh, and the value of DNA methylation is that it's mitotically stable and it's a tractable signature for diagnostics. Um, so there's two main components to the epigenetic code. Uh, actually, there's many others. Uh, one would be to put a methyl group onto the DNA. And the other has to do with methylation and acetylation of histones around which the DNA is packed into this condensed chromatin. And this controls the ability to express certain regions of the genome. And it's very important for that. Um, and uh, this shows you really the DNA methylation part an enzymatic addition onto the 5 position of the cytosine gives you a 5-methyl cytosine, and that actually can silence that particular piece of DNA. And all cases of cancer have detectably abnormal methylation. And also, I will put to you that precancer is predominantly a disease of defective methylation. Now, if we look at the HPV16 genome, uh, methylation can be measured by a number of different ways, and what we see is that in cancer, the L1, L2 regions are very highly methylated in cancers as compared to normals, and CIN23 is somewhere in between. 
not so much in the early regions. Uh, it's interesting, and um, I think this is a response of the virus to the methylation machinery of the host attempting to shut it down. Um, so we did a large study, still unpublished, with the IARC team, and we looked at cancers from around the world. Uh, and this is just a simple box whisker plot. Uh, all of these differences are um, actually highly significant. Here's the normal uh, from the UK. Uh, here's SIN23 from Spain or the UK. And here's the cancers, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Spain, Philippines. Um, and there's the numbers of cases. So really a very highly powered study. Virtually all of the cancers are positive for methylation uh, using this S5 classifier um, that my team have developed. Uh, and uh, I'd like to talk to you about a study that we did in Canada. Uh, this was published recently and it got quite a lot of publicity. Um, and uh, it was a three-arm trial. Methylation was measured in the intervention in the safety arm. And the point was to see how would methylation perform versus cytology or HPV-16-18 genotyping? So the primary outcome was CIN3 plus rates compared between the control arm, which is cytology alone, versus HPV uh, testing with the intervention arm. And here we see the results on the box whisker plot for the categories less than CIN2, CIN3 and cancer, and you can see the upward curve. In fact, all of the cancers were positive uh, in British Columbia. And uh, a table of the main results for CIN23, um, this was the relative sensitivity of methylation, 93.2% um, versus 86.4%. That's for a combination of greater than, equal to ASCA cytology, or HPV-16-18 genotyping. And the positive, the relative positive predictive values of the two arms were the same. Now, an advantage of the methylation in this study was it was done at baseline, whereas the cytology and the 1618 genotyping results were delayed by over one year because they included a follow-up component. Um, there were eight cancers in the trial, uh, and these are called false negative cancers because they slipped through despite a very intensive uh, strategy of screening. And the first point I'd like to make is all of them were positive by methylation. The cutoff here is 0.8. Um, and for those where we had data, the methylation actually increased from the first sampling to the second sampling. Uh, here you can see 2.9 to 12.4. And these are percentage methylations. You can see the time to the cancer from the baseline. They ranged from six months uh, to about five years. Uh, and most of them were adenocarcinomas, which is no surprise. Um, so um, the last little piece that I want to cover is the ability to predict progression. And just focus on this last piece here. This is a study of 149 women in Finland who were followed up with CIN2. So that's just that particular group where they follow in Finland. This is the regression group, this is the persistence group, and this is the progression group. So the progression group have a higher level of methylation. And I'm going to show this to you in the form of a rock curve uh, where we're comparing now to HPV-16-18 performance, HCIL, LCIL, and ASCUS. And the, um, this is for um, regression versus progression. And the methylation test was the best predictor. In fact, these were not statistically different in chance. Only the methylation test uh, was significantly different in chance. And this has actually been submitted for uh, publication recently. Um, so, the, okay, the final point about methylation in self-collection. Uh, it works from urine. Uh, it works from wet swabs and dry swabs. And in fact, uh, is stable for at least two weeks. 
So this is the performance with the, the Dacron wet swab was the best. Um, and uh, these points here show you the HPV 16, 18 genotyping results versus the methylation uh, results. So the best result was by the methylation classifier from the wet Dacron swab. Uh, and um, quite pleasing that uh, self-sampling works. A simple screening algorithm for the future, uh, which might involve HPV testing and methylation. Um, if you uh, have an HPV positive, you reflex the methylation. If the methylation is positive, colposcopy. If the methylation is negative, um, uh, uh, if the HPV is negative, rescreen in five years. And if the uh, methylation is negative uh, on an HPV positive woman, you would rescreen every three years until HPV negative. So that's just a simple scenario that might work. The summary of the talk. Okay, um, worldwide incidence of cancer has not decreased. Um, we do need to focus in on vaccination uh, and screening. Vaginal self-sampling works, and methylation appears to be an improved triage approach. So that comes to the end, and um, I think we're ready for the first question. Um, okay. Okay, highest mortality, no surprise, Africa. Okay, that was, that was a simple one. Question two. So the uh, sensitivity of cytology is lower, but the specificity is higher. Question three. And methylation occurs mostly on, there we go. It's on cytosine. <coughs> and indeed, methyl high levels of methylation occur in most cases. And some methylation occurs in virtually all cases. Um, remarkably impressive biomarker um, methylation is. Okay, so thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, should anyone um, like to ask? Um, got uh, a minute and a half. Two minutes, yeah. maybe two right, questions. Thank you. thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, close to my heart for the uh, HPV and the regression, progression particularly of CIN2. Um, so, when do you think we'll have DNA methylation commercially available? It seems like it's been going around for the last five years. We've got more and more evidence for this. Is this at the stage where it can actually be simplified and put into addition to an HPV test, or are we years away from that? Um, well, it, um, it's a little bit of both. Uh, we, it, it, it has a lot to do with regulatory approvals, for one thing. Um, which can be quite complex. Uh, in Europe, there, there are a number of CE marked methylation kits already available. Kyashur from Kyogen, and uh, uh, a methylation test in Germany. Um, I forget the name, and one in Hungary from Newman Diagnostics. So there's at least three that I know of, um, and the performance of those vary. They all, they're all based on QMSP, Quantitative Methylation Specific PCR. They're very sensitive for cancer, but they have lower sensitivity for SYN2, SYN3 than the S5 classifier that I've described to you. I'm actually working with a company in China, but it's just for Asian use for the S5 test. Um, nothing for the US or, or Canada. That's why I said it's not FDA approved, and I'm not really going to talk about it. Hopefully, a lot of these are going to come within the next five to six years. No reason why 
the technology is certainly right, the costs are not high, um, and I think just getting these things approved and manufactured at high scale, that's probably it. Okay. And a second question, do you see how is this going to integrate with the uh, artificial intelligence, the putting everything together in a black box that has been talked about and Schiffman and those people are talking about? Is this going to be a bit major player in that? Is it going to add to that or are we going to... Do you well, know I, what I mean? The, yes, yeah. yes. Well, I mean, I think uh, all of these things can add to the artificial intelligence, which um, I think just produces a risk score, uh, a risk score with likely outcomes and recommended interventions. Uh, and methylation is a another variable in your risk model, along with history, along with uh, morphology, if you're doing it. So the answer is yes. I don't see anything inconsistent. The, I don't think AI is going to come quite as quickly as they say, and I think it's going to be um, uh, pretty complicated. But obviously it will come um, five, ten years, I don't know. Yeah.